the only circumstance that really matters here is their ubudiya, is their servitude. And a lot of times we say, well, if you want a child, read the story of Zakaria. And if you are impatient, then read the story of Ayyub. <laughs> but Allah says, ni'm al-abd, dhikra lil-abidin. What a beautiful servant of Allah he is. And this is a reminder for the servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, those who want to be the, in that state of devoted servitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, some people may not be afraid of committing crimes on this earth, but when they do something wrong on this earth, with the Muslim particularly, they're existential. They believe that there's something beyond the physical, that the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there is someone that will hold us accountable and he is our creator, he is our maker, which serves as a motivation and also a reminder that there will be a day that I will have to answer to my deeds. Think about all the different ways, of course, that Allah could have saved Ibrahim alayhi salam from the fire, right? Mm. It could have started pouring rain and put out the fire. Allah could have sent the wind to carry Ibrahim to safety. A giant bird could have swooped down, grabbed Ibrahim alayhi salam and carried him to safety. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showed here that Allah changed the very course of nature. He intervened directly and changed the nature of the fire. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh everyone. Welcome back to Quran 30 for 30. Inshallah ta'ala, the question from yesterday's juz, how many times is the name Ar-Rahman mentioned in Surah Maryam? So go ahead and answer below bit in ta'ala. And of course, a reminder, inshallah ta'ala, to please support Yaqeen this month. Please also download the Quran 30 for 30 book and follow along bit in ta'ala with all the chapters that we are doing. And we are blessed today to, of course, have Shaykh Abdullah Duro as always. And Shaykh Abdul Nasir Jengda, how's it going, man? Alhamdulillah, very good. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. So, we're really blessed here in Dallas, alhamdulillah. alhamdulillah. Yaqeen is just a few minutes down the street from Qalam. Absolutely. Alhamdulillah, I mean, I think it's part of the beauty of our collaborations here in this area. Uh, your people always come here, our people always go there. Alhamdulillah. We're all one people, obviously, alhamdulillah. alhamdulillah. I mean, our masajids are close by, and Qalam has become a significant presence here in Dallas, alhamdulillah. alhamdulillah. And obviously, not just for the community here, but mashallah, lots of great students, mashallah. Alhamdulillah. great teachers, obviously. Mashallah. Shaykh, how's, how's Qalam going? It's going good, alhamdulillah. It's, it's busy, keeps us busy, but it's, it's a good busy. Alhamdulillah. alhamdulillah. What made you choose to really, you slowed down your travel quite a bit I did. over the last few years. I did. What made you choose to focus on this? It's two things, because I get asked that question a lot. It's two things. Number one is, I think um, everyone has kind of an inclination something that they gravitate towards so everyone gravitates towards something different education was something that always really motivated me kind of like a systematic long form in the classroom education was what motivated me and number two it was the wasiyah of my sheikh to me Alhamdulillah. Uh, May Allah bless you and have mercy on your Shaykh. Amen. Accept Amen. all the great work that y'all are doing. Amen. So please check out their work with the Nahi Ta'ala. And inshallah Ta'ala with that, we are in the uh, 17th Juz, Walhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. And I am going to be speaking about Bidni Lahi Ta'ala, this beautiful dua from Ayyub alayhi salam, but really connecting it to the previous Juz, which has been, of course, the beauty of this entire season. When Allah Azza wa Jal mentions in verse 84 of Surah Al Anbiya, the dua of Ayyub alayhi salam, uh, verse 83 actually, وَأَيُّوبَ إِذْ نَادَ رَبَّهُ أَنِّي مَسَّنِيَ الضُّرُّ وَأَنْتَ أَرْحَمُ الرَّاحِمِينَ And remember when Ayyub alayhi salam, when the Prophet Job cried out to his Lord and said, I have been touched with adversity and you are the most merciful of those who show mercy. And Allah Azza wa Jal mentions in the next verse, فَاسْتَجَبْنَا لَهُ فَكَشَفْنَا مَا بِهِ مِنْ ضُرُّ that we answered his prayer and we removed his adversity. And then we'll continue with the rest of the ayah shortly, bidnanahi ta'ala. But of course, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in Surah Al-An'am that if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in yamsaska bi durrin fala kashi falahu illahu, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala touches you with adversity, then no one can remove that adversity from you except for him. And you'll see the words here being used that Ayyub alayhi salam says, I've been touched by adversity and you are the most merciful of those who have mercy. And Allah says, فَكَشَفْنَا And we removed, subhanAllah, as if this is a practical example of exactly what He told us would happen, subhanahu wa ta'ala, with His servants. Now, the beautiful thing about Ayyub salam is that he manifests, of course, the most beautiful example of patience when you are struck by adversity. And of course, we always note that he doesn't blame Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the dur, for the harm. 
He only attributes the mercy to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he says that I've been struck with adversity. But here's what I want you to pay attention to inshallah. And of course, these du'as are loaded with so much to reflect on. I just want to reflect on one element. In Juz 16, Allah mentions Zakariya alayhi salam. And Zakariya calling out to his Lord, ذِكْرُ رَحْمَةِ رَبِّكَ عَبْدَهُ Zakariya. Make mention in the book of the mercy of your Lord to his servant Zakariya alayhi salam. إِذْ نَادَ رَبَّهُ نِدَاءً خَفِيَةً When he called out to his Lord in that beautiful private prayer. Almost every word that is used to describe the du'a of Zakariya alayhi salam is used to describe the du'a of Ayyub alayhi salam. Mm. And it's one juz apart. And it's, it's amazing because in both situations, there is an immediate blessing that manifests itself in a miraculous way, but they have very different circumstances, right? Zakariya alayhi salam is calling out to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with hope and never disappointed. Right? And saying, Ya Allah, you've never disappointed me before. And he's appealing to Allah's mercy for a child. And he's never had a child before. So Zakariya alayhi salam, when he calls out to his Lord, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala praises his ubudiyyah, praises his servitude. What a beautiful abd, what a beautiful manifestation of ubudiyyah, of servitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he shows. And here is the mention of the mercy of your Lord upon Zakariya alayhi salam. And in the case of Ayyub alayhi salam, Ayyub is calling out to Allah after a long period, almost two decades of, and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi mentioned in one narration, 18 years of bala, 18 years of trial and tribulation, and calls out to Allah in this humble, beautiful way, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala immediately manifests his mercy towards him uh, alayhi salam. Now here's the thing, they both appeal to the same thing. And so it's really interesting because if you read the words, you wouldn't actually know what circumstances they were in because the only circumstance that really matters here is their ubudiyah, is their servitude. And a lot of times we say, well, if you want a child, read the story of Zakariyah. And if you are impatient, then read the story of Ayyub. But Allah says, ni'm al-abd, dhikra lil-abideen. What a beautiful servant of Allah he is. And this is a reminder for the servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, those who want to be the, in that state of devoted servitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so the lesson here is that no matter what your circumstance is, you should turn to Allah in the exact same way and appeal to the exact same thing, which is His rahmah. And of course, in this situation, just look at the words, right? Dhikru rahmati rabbika, dhikr, rahmah, rabb, abd. A mention of the mercy of your Lord to his slave. And in the situation of Ayyub alayhi salam, it's the exact same thing. And the last thing that I'll say here, of course, is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, this is a mention of the mercy of your Lord, which shows you that it's not the Lord of Zakaria alone or the Lord of Ayyub alone. You're calling upon the same Rabb, the same Lord who removes and who gives even in the most impossible of circumstances out of his mercy and manifests his mercy in the most fitting way. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from his devoted servants in every situation. Allahumma ameen. Inshallah ta'ala pass it off to Shaykh Abdullah. Jazakumullah khair. That was beautiful. Uh, Bismillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala amma ba'du. So remembering the mercy and justice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and also how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is able to do all things. From all things, we always have to remember to maintain our Iman and the strength of it, to establish initially and to maintain it is the belief in the unseen, that there are certain things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not disclose to us. And also there are things that Allah will disclose to us of things that are going to happen in the future. So from that are particularly is the day of resurrection, the day of judgment, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls Yawm al-Qiyamah. Now there'll be a series of things that takes place but what's so interesting, if you sit back and think about it, Allah is actually telling you what's going to happen in the future. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam gets descriptive. I want to cover one verse where Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala says in chapter number 21, verse 47, when he talks about the day when things will be weighed, particularly the deeds of the slave and also their, their, their actions. And also SubhanAllah, we will cover even the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam comparing a body part to showing that it will be heavy on the scales. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, If you are a man of the Lord, you will be able to do the same thing in the same way. If you are a man of the Lord, you will be able to do the same thing in the same way. If you are a man of the Lord, you will be able to do the same thing in 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says beautifully here, beautifully, as every verse is beautiful. Allah says, we shall set up just scales on the day of resurrection. This is the first part of the, the ayah. وَنَضَعُ الْمَوَازِينَ الْقِسْطَ So we will place the mawazin, the scales. Qist and qist is here is the, 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 the adjective describing the scales that they will be just. Qist is justice. So when he puts these scales down, they will be just. Meaning that whatever he weighs from your good deeds, or oh, uh, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, if, if it's an Adam's weight, as we know in another chapter in the Quran, that it will be weighed, nothing will surpass Allah. Allah is not unaware of anything that happens within his dominion, within his creation. So he says here, we will place the scales, مَوَازِنَ الْقِسْطَ لِيَوْمِ الْقِيَامَةِ On the day of resurrection. This is to establish that there will be a day of judgment, which shows that the human being, the Muslim particularly, should know that there is a, a, a day of accountability, a day that you will stand in front of your Lord. You know, some people may not be afraid of committing crimes on this earth, but when they do something wrong on this earth, with the Muslim particularly, they're existential. They believe that there is something beyond the physical that the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there is someone that will hold us accountable and he is our creator, he is our maker, which serves as a motivation and also a reminder that there will be a day that I will have to answer to my deeds. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues on to say, وَإِن كَانَ مِثْقَالَ حَبَّةٍ مِنْ خَرْدَلٍ And even if it was the weight of a grain of a mustard seed, showing that nothing will surpass Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's knowledge and nothing can surpass his ability because he is the one that puts the scales and every single thing will be weighed. This is where the individual has what is called muhasaba. They hold themselves accountable, muraqaba. They watch over their deeds, they watch over themselves. We know the beautiful statement of Umar bin al-Khattab that he used to say, hasibu anfusakum qabla an tuhasabu wa zinu a'malakum qabla an zanu. It's beautiful, he says, hold yourselves accountable before you will be held accountable and weigh your deeds before they will be weighed. Brothers and sisters, before you go to sleep, have a review of your day. What did you do in that day? Because you don't know if you will wake up. And the day, we don't know when the day of resurrection will be. The fact that it's a mystery should increase our raja, our hope in Allah's mercy. Our hope in Allah's mercy, and also fear of any type of accountability from a shortcoming. With the reality, with some of our shortcomings, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy encompasses and engulfs everything and it's up to him to forgive us or not. Lastly, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَكَفَى بِنَا hasibin," And this is so beautiful, the tadheel, the way that Allah ends this verse. When he talks about accountability and nothing will surpass him, one should think about what am I doing now? I don't know when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take me. How do I want my status to be with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Then Allah says here, and suffice with us as reckoners. Kifa bina, with us. This is a showing of greatness. Even though there's no plurality with the creator, this is a form of greatness and royalty that when he uses the plur plurality to show the majesty that he is great, subhanahu wa ta'ala. He says, suffice for us is a reckoner. Why is this important for the individuality of the Muslim in understanding that I am not afraid of ultimately anyone except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I do not fear what this person will say as long as I am obeying Allah because he is my ultimate reckoner. He is the one that will hold me accountable for my deeds. So when it comes to making a choice because of that strong foundation and the belief in the oneness of Allah and his greatness and his ability, and there will be a day that the scales will be weighed, deeds will be weighed, we recognize that and that should serve as our motivation for wanting to please him within these trials and tests May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us of those that are aware of his greatness mm -hmm. and aware of his justice mm -hmm. and allow that to be a sense of solace and peace in our hearts. Mm -hmm. Shaykh, tafadun. The story of Ibrahim alayhi salam, which is mentioned in Surah Al-Anbiya, Surah number 21, is really fascinating. One of the remarkable stylistic marvels of the Qur'an is that the Qur'an returns back to the same story repeatedly while highlighting different elements of that story. But maybe one of the most well-known of the stories of the prophets of the past, and something that is a, 
symbolically is very powerful and universally recognized by believers everywhere is only mentioned one place in the Quran. And that's here in the 17th Juz in chapter 21, Surah number 21, Surah Al-Anbiya. And it's a very lengthy passage that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala details the whole story, beginning with ayah number 51, going all the way to ayah number 70. But the culmination of the story, the climax of the story, if you will, is in verse number 69, ayah number 69, in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, قُلْنَا We said, Ya nar, O fire, kuni bardan wa salaman ala Ibrahim. Be cool and peaceful, safe upon Ibrahim alayhi salam. And very quickly, the backstory is, is that Ibrahim alayhi salam, after trying over and over and over again to reason with his people, to try to get them to understand that the worship of idols was something false. And they were so stubborn that they just were not coming around. So Ibrahim salam decided to take more drastic measures. When they were all gone for a festival or a carnival out of town, he went into the temple, he smashed all the idols, illa kabira lahum, and he left the largest one so that they would have to come back and deal with this reality. When they come back and they find all the idols smashed, they say, oh, uh, يُقَالُ لَهُ Ibrahim." This young man, Ibrahim, is always criticizing our idols. So they brought him, فَأْتُوا بِهِ عَلَىٰ أَعْيُنِ النَّاسِ لَعَلَّهُمْ يَشْهَدُونَ Let's make an example out of him. And then they decide to, when Ibrahim salam challenges them about the reality of these false gods and these idols, and they are unable to answer him, then finally they resort to violence as people upon falsehood will always do. When they are confronted with the truth, when they have no response for the truth, then they will resort to violence, indiscriminate violence. This, was, oh. this has been the trend all throughout history. This happened in the lifetime of the Prophet and we even see this happening today. So what did they say? Burn him at the stake and help your gods. They turned it into a campaign. In kuntum fa'ilin. And then the narration of Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala anhu that Ibn Kathir, Imam al-Qurtubi, others mention that they built this humongous fire and people came and started throwing everything they had, old clothes and old furniture into the fire to the point where it became like a forest fire. They couldn't contain it. They couldn't get near it. So then they said, okay, how do we put Ibrahim in the fire now? So they constructed a device like a catapult to launch him into the fire. They tie him up. Ibrahim alayhi salam puts his faith and trust in Allah. And he speaks those words that have been immortalized within the Quran, which in which he says, Hasbi Allahu and Allah is all I need. Allah suffices for me. And Allah is the best of caretakers. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala intervened for Ibrahim alayhi salam. And in verse number 69, Allah says, We said, O fire, become cool and safe and peaceful upon Ibrahim. And there's two quick reflections that I'll give here. Number one is that think about all the different ways, of course, that Allah could have saved Ibrahim alayhi salam from the fire. Right? Mm. It could have started pouring rain and put out the fire. Allah could have sent the wind to carry Ibrahim to safety. A giant bird could have swooped down, grabbed Ibrahim alayhi salam and carried him to safety. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showed here that Allah changed the very course of nature. He intervened directly and changed the nature of the fire. And then the second thing that I'll mention in closing here is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Abdullah bin Masood radiallahu ta'ala anhu mentions that when Allah said, O fire, be cool and safe and peaceful upon Ibrahim, there were ropes that were tied to his hands and his feet. Those ropes were against Ibrahim, not for Ibrahim. The ropes burned away without burning a single inch on his skin, without harming a hair on his head. The ropes were burned, but Ibrahim was not harmed at all. This is the power, this is the majesty, this is the might of Allah. This is what we believe in. And we need these reminders constantly. But I feel really now more than ever that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can do anything and everything. And so even when all the worldly means don't make any sense, 
and it seems like there's no way out, we have to keep our faith in the power and the might of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. SubhanAllah feekum. SubhanAllah Shaykh, like these, a lot of the du'as and a lot of the things that, you know, we learned about through powerful stories, we're now obviously witnessing with the people of Gaza, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help them alleviate their, their struggles and their pain, all of the mustalafin around the world, of Amen. course, in Jerusalem and Palestine and, you know, the whole area, you see the cruelest enemy and you see the most faithful people. Ajib. And so we're going to, bidna nahi ta'ala, witness a turning point. Shum. And we have that certainty, bidna nahi ta'ala. I think one thing that I always try to emphasize to people is that the people of Gaza didn't just find this faith now. Mm. They had it. Mm -hmm. And one thing that's very apparent, like when you're going through the stories of the prophets, look, Zakaria knew, alayhi salam, when he needed to turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for a child, he needed to turn to Allah. Mm. Ayyub alayhi salam knew that with everything that happened to him, the only one he could turn to was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ibrahim alayhi salam knew whether he was in a fire mm. or whether he was in the comfort of his home, mm. turn back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's like when they say you can't know only one or two names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Mm -hmm. To know Allah, you have to know his names and attributes. Mm -hmm. And to know all of his names and attributes, you have to know different circumstances. Mm -hmm. And the prophets were subjected to the most extreme manifestations of all of those circumstances. Mm -hmm. And so they had the most extreme connections to all of those oh, names wow. and attributes, mm -hmm. right? Their du'as were loving, sincere, devoted. And so the seemingly impossible happened mm -hmm. for them in ways that we could never imagine. But that's directly tied to their tawakkud. It's not just their stations as prophets. Mm. It's their stations as ibad, mm. as, as being great servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so that's why when you, when you see, like I think the scholars of the past, like when Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah mm. talks about tawakkud in, mm. in Madaraj al sadiqin you know, what, when you really, really, really realize this trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, things happen for you that don't happen for other people. Mm. And that's why you have the mu'jizat, mm. Right, these miracles of the prophets, but you also have the karamat al awliya. You, you have the, the miracles of the awliya, the miracles of the friends of Allah that yeah. aren't prophets, but yeah. things happen for them Absolutely. that, that yeah. otherwise you know, are outside of what we are familiar with. Yeah. How do you, and, and I guess this is a question I'll pose to both of you, how do you say to someone like, I don't believe a miracle is possible in my life, or, because there are two extremes to this, one is, yeah. is a miracle even possible for me, or, if the miracle doesn't happen for me, that means that Allah is not answering my dua. Mm. Right? It's kind of like there's some people of like the miracle is impossible or the miracle didn't happen, therefore my relationship with Allah is impossible. Mm. How do you mm. kind of talk to people as they're trying to find themselves between these miracles and they're yeah. not seeing them manifest in their own lives? Yeah. You know, something interesting because the story of Ibrahim alayhi salam, as I mentioned, you know, it's something that's really universally known and recognized as maybe one of the most well-known of the stories of the prophets, but particularly during times of difficulty and tragedy in the ummah, my mind, my heart always goes back to this particular story for that exact reason. There were so many steps along the way where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could have, uh, where, where one might have expected the intervention to come at earlier moments, when they're nabbing him, mm. when they're tying him up when they're starting the fire, when they're putting him in the catapult, when they're launching him, when he's midair. There's so many moments where the intervention, one could have expected it, but it came at the time that was the most powerful and most effective, mm -hmm. where it became something that people would remember and talk about and reflect upon for the rest of time. So much so that we're sitting here, only Allah knows how many millennia later, halfway across the world, and we're reflecting on it once again. So it's, it's going back to these stories is ultimately the way to find that kind of strength and consolation and comfort. And it might seem a bit obtuse to some people, but just going back to those stories and you know, mentioning those stories and reflecting on those stories together, I think ultimately is what provides that comfort. That it's the same Allah that we're praying to, and He has the same might and power that He had when He saved Ibrahim, alayhi salam, and He can do the same exact 
quote unquote, impossible, make the impossible possible, the miracle happened today like he did at that time. Yeah. I have to say one thing here, because he just said it and, it and it just occurred to me, right? When you say like, we're still talking about someone mm. thousands of years later, mm. their exact words mm. that happened in a moment of time when they were at their lowest and loneliest points. Ajib. Ibrahim is in a roaring fire. Ajib. If you ever heard a fire roar, mm. think Frank. about his words. May Allah protect us from the fire. Amen, Allah, amen, amen. Amen, amen. Think about how muted his words would be mm. in that fire, mm. with the roaring fire. Mm. Hasbi Allah wa ni'mad wakil. And, and, and we hear them. Mm. Yeah. And then Ibrahim is in the desert, and ma yablugu salti. What's mm. gonna cause my voice to reach all these people yeah. in the desert, <laughs> right? Just adhin fin nas, just yes. do it. Zakariya is in a corner of Al-Aqsa. Mm. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala liberated. Allahumma mm. ameen. And he nada rabbahu nida and khafiya. Like he's speaking so low that no one else can hear him mm. from, from the khalq around him, from the creation, except that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wills. And here we are talking about it now. Mm. Ayyub alayhi salam has been shunned by all of society at this point. Mm. No one's around him. And he's calling out to Allah in this private dua. He's shunned. Mm. And Allah Azza wa has it immortalized in Quran. All of these people's du'as are in Quran. Dhikru, yeah. <laughs> dhikra, yeah. mm. we're reciting it constantly. Mm. I mean, it's, it just shows you how you don't know what's happening in that moment in history. Mm. How, how consequential that moment is in the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? in the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for everything yeah. that's yeah. to come, subhanAllah. Yeah, subhanAllah. I mean, it's, it's, that's what I was, going to mention it about the statement of Ibrahim, I mean, we're seeing this online, our brothers and sisters in Gaza, they keep saying it, right? And then Allah SWT says, mm. Allah is enough for me, right? Mm. Allah is enough for me. So when it comes to a miracle, I ask that individual to think about even what is a miracle? A miracle is something beyond human capabilities. And who is Allah? Look at those beautiful names, those attributes. Each one of them are totally beyond our capabilities. Therefore, which is part of the reason why we count on him and we worship him. And it's not conditional to our intellectual capacity. So when thinking about the miracle, okay, it's when Allah chooses, but in the end of the day, it's this term of uncertainty tolerance, mm. right? I'm not certain when it's going to happen, but I'm certain he has the capabilities to make it happen. Am I okay with that? Mm. The fact that it doesn't turn on that I'm okay with it, or at certain times I may ask why, that's human. But what's most important is when you realize that, how do you retreat into fir ilallah mm. and return to him? It's about what happens at that moment. And getting back to Allah, it's not easy at times. Mm. It's a fitna, it's a, it's a struggle. You think what they're saying, hasbi Allah, ni'ma hasbi Allah, it is some type of, you know, some would say cognitive behavioral therapy. You're like speaking to yourself to bring yourself back mm. to spiritual sanity. And that's what's needed because we're human. We're insan. Because sometimes we are, you know, this beautiful word insan is, comes from nesia and also comes from uns. Like nesia means you're forgetful at times. And uns means having that closeness or sociability. But that closeness ultimately is to be like Ibrahim was. Khalilullah. Mm. And that's why, subhanAllah, you mentioned times of being alone. The last 10 days of Ramadan, what are they? I'tikaf. Mm -hmm. Being alone and intimate with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, putting your phone away, fasting from food, drinks, and, and, and being with people and electronics as well. Mm -hmm. And getting close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Khalwa. Mm -hmm. We see this is what the Salaf had with our scholars said, Khalwa, spending time alone, just silence. Oh. Nowadays they call it meditation, right? <laughs> <laughs> But we have this, this system and this framework that's been given to us to come closer to Him, to know that Allah is enough for us. And when the miracles come, the miracle itself, we know that it's from Allah. We need chooses to, it's up to us to be patient. And that takes a struggle, but Allah loves the struggle. Can I say, you Allah. Allah bless you. Yeah, it's the leap of faith. That, that term means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. And mm -hmm. it's used by sometimes other kind of like religions and, you know, other faiths in a way that probably wouldn't agree with our understanding of aqidah. Mm -hmm. Because we have nusus, we have the text, we got wahi, we have Quran and sunnah. But this would be the Islamic application of the leap of faith. Mm 
Mm-hmm. We know what we believe from the textual evidence, but then that thing that you were talking about, that, that acceptance and tolerance mm-hmm. for knowing exactly when, where, and how. Mm-hmm. That's the leap of faith. Yeah. Yeah, SubhanAllah. Mufti Kamani was talking about leap of faith too, by the way, when oh, really? he was here. So really? Something in Qalam about leaps of faith. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Y'all must be doing a lot of leaping. <laughs> leaping at Qalam. They have, a big, they have a big campus. So big campus, 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 campus. Texas side campus. Jazakallah khairan. Beautiful yeah. reflection. Yeah. Shaykh Abdul Nasser. May Allah bless you and uh, increase you. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us all to manifest those beautiful qualities of the prophets. Allahumma yes. ameen. Inshallah mm-hmm. ta'ala, we will see you all tomorrow. Barakallahu feekum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.